Good evening. Welcome to our psalm study, Psalm 117. I titled it today, tonight, The Big Picture. This psalm, all two verses of it, that's right, it only has two verses, is one of the most amazing chapters in all of Scripture, as you'll see. This psalm, when properly understood, shows the immense mind of God, as well as the simplistic, the simplistic level at which he reaches mankind. Mankind is caught today between what I believe are the creative genius of God's big picture and the small picture. We have, we call it the, uh, he has shown us the minutest creation, especially with all of our technology. We're now developing that, as I'll show you. And then his infinite creation, both unfathomable to us, between what I like to call the micro, which is inner space, and the macro, which is outer space. Let's look at the amazing micro world of God's creative genius. Speculation was finally confirmed in the 19th century when the chemist John Dalton carried out a series of sophisticated experiments on gases the average diameter of an atom, smallest thing they, at that point that they thought they knew, measured about 50 nanocentimeters, a millionth of a grain of sand. The atom was then the smallest thing known to man. Quarks are the small, smallest particles, they, they're smaller than atoms, we have come across in our scientific endeavor. Discovery of quarks meant that protons and neutrons weren't fundamental anymore. That's what the 19th century told us. For more thorough understanding, you need to peel apart a piece of matter and discover its con constituents by removing each layer one by one. What is smaller than a quirk? The diameter of the proton is about as much as a millimeter divided by a thousand billion. And I know these are huge numbers for us. Just follow the gist of what we're talking about. Physicists cannot yet compare what's larger, a quark, Higgs boson, or an electron. Higgs boson, you heard of the Higgs boson accelerator. Uh, they're trying to accelerate that particle. They call it the God particle. It's so tiny, so small. So we can say that an electron is lighter than a quark, quark but we cannot say that it's smaller. So it kind of gets confusing. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of, a, of an understanding of it. So there's your atom. Look how large the atom is. And now look at a quark. You go all the way over here to this purple, and that tiny quark is the smallest thing we right now know. And we know that there's also things inside of that, though we don't have seen them all. So let me give it to you more in a picture form. This is, a, this is a four hard shell different types of condort. They're actually microfossils, and they were full-blooded marine animals. That's what you're seeing there. What you're looking at, they're all sitting on the top of a pin, and if you can see that, and there's room for others. So it's pretty amazing. The head of a pin they're on, and there's still room to spare. Let me give you a little bit more. This is the micro radiolarian. It's a fossilized shell of an ocean animal that's now extinct. It lived off the coast of Antarctica. God created these animals as climate and water regulators when the earth was one landmass, Pangaea. This one is magnified 1,392 times. I can easily place 5,000 of these creatures on my fingernail. Uh, we would never know they existed without the scanning electron microscope. So what else is in the, exists in the micro world that we can't see? Remember, this is all God's creation. So when I'm talking about seeing the big picture, we're talking about God is an infinite creator. And so much so that we don't even know down to the small or micro scale what he's actually created. So what's also amazing to me is everything, and I mean everything, both in micro and macro space, is rotating on somewhat circular patterns. Atoms rotate. Quarks rotate. Our solar system rotates, planets rotate, our universe is, I believe some of the, some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the biggest stars rotate. So um, this was, this is the electron micro, this is, excuse me, this is the, the uh, accelerator that's trying to take the smallest of particles, accelerate it close to the speed of life and smash it so they can see what will come out of it. One of the fears here is they can actually create a black hole which will actually suck everything into it. So there's so much, and what's my point? Not to, not to get us to understand all these things. My point is that God made all these things. The infinite power of God made these things that we can't even get to the bottom of, even in the micros microscopic uh, era of it. So let's go to the mac macro. The observable universe is 93 billion light years in diameter. Some science believe its true size is even scarier than that. By using the Bayesian model averaging, scientists estimated that the universe is at least 250 times larger than the observable universe, or at least seven trillion light years in diameter. What that means is if you wanted to go across the universe, it would take you seven trillion years traveling at 186 miles per second. This is unfathomable. None of our minds could even be wrapped around that. By the way, in our own solar system, the Milky Way, that's where we are. It's a tiny little span. That's talking, excuse me, in, our, in, in the Milky Way galaxy, our solar system is right here at one of the spiral ends. 
very tiny. That's our sun and all of our planets that is around it. So it's an immense thing. If we can get a little closer to see some of the things, this is uh, 350 million miles away. This is the Martian crater surface. This is, Mar this is Mars. So at 350 million miles away, just to give you a little relative understanding, a car driving 100 miles per hour nonstop would take 259 years to reach Mars. <laughs> and this is the smallest moon in the solar system. It's true color. This is Io, and it's from Jupiter. These are, this is from the Hubble photog photography, most distant object takes 4 billion light years to reach us. That means it's light that we see is 4 billion years old. So somebody asked me, well, how is that? If we have creation, it's only 10,000 years old. Well, God made those stars. He made everything aged. He made Adam and Eve aged. They weren't babies. When somebody asked you what came first, the chicken or the egg, it's an easy answer. If you believe in creation, it's the chicken. Because God made everything mature. These, this light was already hitting us when God made it. But it's a full 4 billion years takes to come to us. God made the stars aged with their light already reaching us. So this is a little look at some of our some of the other galaxies that are out there. Again, we're talking about like a Milky Way galaxy, a spiral, Andromeda galaxy. This is the star Eta. It's about to explode, by the way. It's 100 times larger than our sun, and it's in deep space. And this they just found. They call it the Eye of God. It is a nebula that's way, way out there. So what's my purpose today? Well, my purpose is to tell you that we're stuck or caught or created in between a micro world and a macro world. It's what I call inner space. Before I get there, let me tell you about the infinite. If I had a laser and I pointed it up at a night sky tonight, it would travel 186 miles per second, speed of light. It would take 1.5 seconds to reach the moon. It would take 5.1 to 1, 5 .1 minutes to reach Mercury, 2.3 minutes to reach Venus, 4.2 minutes to reach Mars, and 34.6 minutes to reach Jupiter. It would take 1 hour and 11.4 11, 11 minutes to reach Saturn, 1 hour and 53 minutes to reach Uranus, two hours and nine minutes reach Neptune, and three hours and 32 minutes reach Pluto, which was just, just brought down from a planet. While in contrast, driving at 100 miles an hour would take us 259 years, as I told you, driving, driving time to reach Mars. So we are caught and created in what's called inner space. This is where God has focused all of his attention. Even though he's made the expanses of the universe and the minutest things in the microverse, this is where we are. This is what God concentrates on. Jerusalem, by the way, in Israel, is the center of that. It's actually the center of three continents, Africa, Europe, and Asia. That's a very old map that I'm showing you. And it's also the center of the, uh, of the, of the land space in, in the world. This is a, a globe that shows the center to the other side. It has a little story of it. How Jer this is in Israel, how, it, how Israel is the center of the world. And if you really looked at it, let's get a little bit further. The elevation of Israel is like this, if you can see my hand. We have Mount Hermon up by the Golan, past the Golan is up here. The Dead Sea is down here. Mount Hermon is 6,627 feet above sea level, mi almost a mile and a quarter. And then you have below sea level, the lowest place on earth, 1,300 feet below sea level is the Dead Sea. So actually Israel is built almost in a micro and a macro. And right center of that, in the middle space again, is Jerusalem at 2,600 feet above sea level. So God has some type of amazing plan uh, that he really has been showing us. Spiritually and physically, Israel is the center, of, our, uh, center of, of the world. So why? What does it all mean? And why and how does Psalm 117 relate to it? Well, here it is. Hidden deep in the, in the placement of this psalm is a sophisticated numbering phenomenon that only God could have assigned. And I warn you, it's too precise to be coincidental. I call it the middle connection. Psalm 117, here's some facts. It is the shortest chapter in the Bible. It is the exact middle chapter of the Bible. 594 chapters are before it, 594 chapters are after it. There are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. When the Psalms were compiled, no one knew this would end up in the exact middle of the Bible. The shortest Psalm with two verses. Does one verse tell us of the preceding 594 chapters? The other verse of the remaining 594 chapters? Furthermore, there are exactly 1,189 chapters in the Bible. A total of 1,188 chapters apart from middle chapter. Now look at the Psalm 118.8. That is the exact middle verse of the Bible. Now consider this. Psalm 117, and you'll see 118.8 next week. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter, middle chapter. 118 contains the middle verse of the Bible. And Psalm 119 is the longest chapter of the Bible. That is definitely arranged by God. So is God trying to tell us something in these three Psalms, Psalm 117, 118, and 119? Is there more here than meets the eye or ear? These three psalms are a remarkable product of divine design. 
The three psalms were purposely planned to come together for a definite reason. The reason was that sooner or later, people like us would unravel the numbers and see yet again a godly design, just like the micro and the macro universes. Perhaps that would spark our faith to trust him even more, because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in order to praise him even louder and to follow him more closely. Psalm 117 serves as an illustration of divine design and consequently proof of the divine inspiration that guided not only the writer of the Psalms, but watch this, thousands of years later is guiding you and guiding me as we listen to these truths. I've titled this Psalm tonight, Seeing the Big Picture. My outline is simple. Can anyone guess how many points it'll have? That's right, two, based on the two verses. A call to worship, verse one, and a call to wonder, verse two. Let's look at the call to worship. It says, Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. Pretty simple verse. Isn't it exciting to know that God doesn't require long prayers? That's a prayer. The issue is never the length of words or how many O's you can pronounce God with. I've heard so many people pray and they seem to be masterful prayers. And I'm not making fun of anyone, but God doesn't require long prayers. People think he does. He does not. He doesn't require you to use a, a different voice. That's not what prayer is about. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen of them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give the needy, do not, give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, the right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, here it is, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen, and let me, and let me also adjust that to, and, and heard by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their full reward. But when you pray, go to your room, close your door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like p pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. So this tonight is going to tell you how to praise God, how to pray to God. Jesus is teaching on doing religious things to be seen by, by men. The best prayers you'll ever pray are spontaneous, and pardon what I, my, my language, but gut prayers, right from your gut. Deep down, true-rooted prayers. We can get into spiritual vocabulary rambling so easily. Sometimes we pray the same words over and over again. It's a vain rambling. Oh God, I pray you touch the infirmities of such and such. Oh Lord, we humbly worship you. And Lord, we, for your extended hand of mercy and blessing. All those words, that's fine. But if we're in ruts like that, we're not really praying spontaneously. Or what I call lay me down the sleeper prayers. Nothing wrong with the prayer. But it becomes meaningless by repetition. The more you repeat it, the less it means. Here's my version of, oh Lord, lay me down to sleep. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And if I live another day, I pray the Lord thy God to guide my way. Amen. Maybe just adding a couple things or making a change. I remember one day on a scaffold on a home that I owned in Florida, about 7 o'clock in the morning, when I heard a jogger on the street who didn't think anyone was there. I was high up. He was telling the Lord out loud how much he loved him. It was absolutely amazing. I could feel the anointing all over him. It was real. It was from, it was from his heart. And he, didn't, he was doing it with no one else around. That, to me, is one of the best definitions of prayer. I never want to pray just to be heard. I never want to sing just to, be, just to hear notes. I never want to preach just to preach. Long ago, when we were planting churches, someone asked me why I would preach at the church we're starting up in Hoover. We started a church and only had about 15 people. And I would go there early in the morning on Sunday. I'd preach a message. I'd drive as fast as I could under the law uh, to, to where my other church was. And I'd preach to thousands uh, a different message. And I did it for almost two years. And somebody said, why in the world would you do that? Well, it's the same reason why I preach, this, preach today, anywhere, or teach. It's my heart's desire. I never stop sharing the word. I love it. I can pastor forever. I can be a preacher forever. I don't even think about retirement. As long as I can teach and preach and be myself in God's presence. And I love to pray. When I get up, I pray. When I drive, when I'm alone, sometimes a long drive and I'm by myself, that's a great time for me to pray. Well, are you looking at the road? Of course I am. But are your eyes closed? Are your hands folded? Absolutely not. But I'm not so crazy about formal prayers that people expect me to pray. I've never clocked my prayers. You know, pray for 30 minutes, then stop. 
To me, that's as bad as not praying at all. I remember when he was a young Christian, I'd go to an all-night prayer meeting. And I remember <laughs> in the pew, some, some would fall asleep, and that's fine. We were like the disciples. And I remember others would just keep looking at their watches. That's not really what God wants. I saw, I saw a clock the other day, and it uh, kind of fascinated me. And maybe that's what we need to do when we get to praying. Not look at the numbers. Just allow it to be understood. One day, Bob and Joe and Dave were hiking in the wilderness area when they came upon a large, raging, violent river. They needed to get to the other side, but they had no idea how to do it. So Joe prayed to God, saying, Please, God, give me the strength to cross this river. Poof! God gave him big arms and strong legs, and he was able to swim across the river in about two hours, although it almost drowned a couple, he almost drowned a couple of times. Seeing this, Dave prayed to God, saying, Please, God, give me the strength and the tools to cross the river. Poof! God gave him a rowboat, and he was able to row across in about an hour after almost capsizing the boat a couple times. Bob had seen how this worked uh, out for the other two, so he also prayed to God, saying, Please, God, give me the strength and the tools and the intelligence to cross the river. Poof! God turned her into a woman. She looked at the map, hiked upstream a couple of hundred yards, and then walked across the bridge. Sometimes we try to copy prayers and just add a little bit to it. That's really not what we're supposed to do. Prayer is a communication. Can you imagine me going home and telling my wife, Cheryl, okay, for the next 30 minutes I'm going to talk to you, then I have to leave, I'm going to watch my clock, and then every five minutes looking at my watch? See, I don't like restrictions when I'm with God, either short or long. If someone has a burden to pray for someone, and they come to me and say, Pastor Mark, I have a burden to pray for someone. Would you, would you agree and pray with me? Well, I would definitely agree with them. But if they say, would you, would you pray and, and, and would you call them up and pray for them? I'd say, well, you have the burden. If you have a burden, you do that and do it right now. It's important when we're moved by the Spirit to do that. The psalmist isn't, isn't uh, constrained by time in Psalm 117. He quickly gets to the heart of the matter. He uses three specific, two specific words in verse 1 that sums up the middle ground we talked about tonight. Actually, three words. All ye people. That's what he uses. All ye people. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. The Old Testament is explicit in the fact that God would use the Jews to bless the Gentiles. Genesis eighteen nineteen. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and he shall keep the way of the Lord. Genesis eighteen nineteen. Talking about one of our patri- patriarchs, Jewish patriarchs. In Galatians, 3.8, it says this, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. The courtyard of the Gentiles is in, was, in the first, was in the second temple. It was a fenced area outside the tabernacle. There is that fenced area right there. That's the courtyard of the Gentiles. It was planned in the Jewish temple. There was an area for the Gentiles. Uh, it separated the tribes of Israel from the sanctified holy ground of the Lord. It was accessed by three curtain panels 30 feet across. The entrance faced the east and was called the gate. The enclosure was set in the middle ground of the 12 tribes of Israel, but it kept human eyes off the sacred work inside. It was the first separation of God and man and represented the law. Note that as large as it was, there was only one way in. What many people don't realize is that everything given by God has a purpose and tells us something important about his will and him for man. The courtyard was a close, as close as people could get to God's presence in the Holy of Holies. But God was saying in all of this that there was a way. However, everyone was allowed to take the first step. This courtyard was the first step to go through the gate past the law that showed sin and closed us off since Adam. But God was also saying that he would take, make a way in the same way that one day a Messiah would come and enter the temple from the eastern gate. Here the Messiah is pointed to us as well. This is what Yeshua HaMashiach was talking about when he stated, I am the gate, in John chapter 10, verse 7. He also said that he was not the end of the Torah, the law, but the fulfillment of it. It's an interesting side note that Hebrew has only consonants to make up its language in writing. You've got to add the vowels. And when Yeshua came, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so the vowels fill, fills in and completes the alphabet. There is a way to the Most High God, Yeshua said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So this court of the Gentiles, and there's a stone that actually talked about it. So those court of the Gentiles found in, in archaeological ruins that talked about the Gentiles. So God made a way for everyone, and we've been adopted in. Jesus was sent for his people, the Jews, and he was sent for the nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles. So the psalmist prays the most significant prayer anyone ever can pray, 
It's a call to worship prayer. The most worshipful word in Scripture is this one. Hallelujah. Found only four times in all of Scripture. It means praise ye Yah, or Yahweh. Revelation 19.1 After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Revelation 19.3 Revelation 19.4 Revelation 19.6 It's only found in the book of Revelation, the last book that ends with praise to God. Hallelujah is not Hallelujah is not in Scripture. It comes from the Hebrew word Halal, which is the name of these psalms, the Halal psalms, the praise psalms. Praise ye Yah. Psalm 117 is the last of the Halal praise psalms. So, Let's go to Psalm 117. If it's a call to worship, it's also a call to wonder. The second point. For his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the, word, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye the Lord. A call to wonder. I like the word forever there. Uh, there's, and this is one of my favorite titles for God, and I've taught it many times. You've probably heard me say it. One of his names is called El Olam. El Olam is the God of the vanishing point. It's the God of the everlasting. Uh, and I, there is a built-in wonder in following God. He always was. He always will be. He was not created by anything. He will never cease to exist. And so it's really interesting to us of how God's personality and his character is in this El Olam, this, this amazing ability for him to be there uh, since be, before time and also after time. And so we know that this is that a wonder to us. It's a mystery sometimes that we're not really understanding. Uh, I have a little quote that I made. Worship is what we give God. Wonder is what God returns to us. When we worship Him, the wonder comes back to us. So the vanishing point can be shown like this. It's a point in the distance. You know those, those railroad lines are uh, parallel to each other, but in the distance it looks like it goes off forever. That's a train. You look into the distance, it goes off forever. It gives you the understanding of the foreverness. There again, and that one's a pretty interesting one also. Just, just parallel lines that go off in the distance. This is exact. God is true. He stays the same. But he's forever in, in the distance past and in the distance future. And Habakkuk tells us this. Look among the nations and see wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told. Speaking, God speaking. So God is a wonder. Whenever we miss the wonder of God, we're going to miss the worship of God. There are certain things about God that we don't understand. When I, was, when I was in grade school, they taught us about the seven wonders of the ancient world. And uh, the statue of Zeus, the Temple of Artemis, the uh, mausoleum at Hercules uh, We know the Colossus of Rhodes, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, Pyramids of Egypt, and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Let me show you some of these. Let me tell you a little bit about them. First off, that's the Great Pyramids of Giza. The Great Pyramid of Khufu, or Cheops, is the oldest and largest of them all. It was built in 2600 BC. It took 27 years to complete. It was the tallest man-made structure in the world for 3,800 years, made up of 2.3 million large blocks and weighing a total of 6 million tons. We still don't know how they did that. I have my ideas, but that's another study. Then we have the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar II built them around 605 BC for his Median wife. She was from Media, Queen Amethyst, because she missed the green hills and the valleys of her homeland, Media. They were built alongside the Grand Palace of Babylon. Then we have, oh, let's go back the other way. Then we have the Lighthouses of Alexandria, built by Ptolemy II, King of Egypt, 280 BC, 330 feet high. For centuries, it was the tallest man-made structure in the world. Three earthquakes took it down from 956 AD to 1323 AD. This is the Temple of Diana at Ephesus. Some of you that are going to Greece with us will see the remnants of this, the remaining part of it. Built around 550 BC, it took 10 years to build. It was destroyed by uh, Herostratus in 356 BC as an act of arson. It was rebuilt by the Ephesians in 326 BC. All marble, 377 feet long, 151 feet wide, and 40 feet high. Think about these structures in the ancient world. And then you have the statue of Zeus at Olympia. Erected in the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, the giant seated statue was made with ivory plates and gold panels on a wooden frame, 600 BC. His throne was ornamental and it was, it was decorated with ebony, ivory, gold, and precious stones. It was destroyed around 500 BC. And then you have this, the mausoleum and hill of Carnassus. It was a tomb built between 353 and 350 BC. We actually get our word mausoleum from this. 
the statue of Korea in the western in the satrap of Korea in Western Persia, the Persian Empire built it for Mausolus and his sister's wife, Artemisia II. 148 feet high, it was destroyed by the successive earthquakes from 1200 to 1500 AD. And this one is really an amazing one. The Colossus of Rhodes straddled two islands in the Aegean, uh, or also called the Colossus of the Sun. It was a statue of the Greek sun god, to the Greek sun god Helios, built in 260 BC, 108 feet high. It was the size of the Statue of Liberty. The tallest statue in the ancient world it spanned, as I said, two islands destroyed by an earthquake in 226 BC. Why am I telling you all this? Habakkuk, and Habakkuk, as well as other places, God promises to give us wonders. Not these types of wonders, not man-made wonders, but spiritual, supernatural wonders. Psalm 105, 5 says, Remember marvelous works that he has done, his wonders, and the judgment of his mouth. We're not apt to be showing pictures of what God has done, but you're a wonder. I'm a wonder. Think about the miracles God has done for you. It's much better than building a 256-foot statue that spans two harbors. That may make your eyes pop a little bit, but the wonders that God does are way beyond that. We see this in Psalm 77, 14. Ask for your miracle. You are God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. That is a statement. You are a God who performs wonders. In the New Testament, the word wonder is the word teros. From the word terra, as in terra firma, the earth, literally, and this is the point tonight, God moving the earth for his people. When I think of the wonders of God, think about what's just beyond the realm of the visible sight. What's around the bend? What's beyond the vanishing point? I think of how God has stretched out promises for you and for me. I think about your life and my life tonight. I could look back in mine and see the wonders of God. Man, if it was a book, I could, I could give you the seven wonders of Mark Carell, and it's way beyond seven. And I'm sure you could do the same. They're phenomenal because they're supernatural. And it's definitely by God's hand. This is what the psalmist was talking about. He was talking about praising God for, for his worshiping for his wonders. That's exactly what he's talking about. Two verses, middle of the Bible. Praise God, worship him for his wonders. It says everything that you ever need and I ever need to know. First Corinthians chapter 2. But as it is written, eyes not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. One day, you and I will see and hear things that man can only, can only try to imagine. It's going to be way beyond any wonder you could possibly imagine. Heaven is going to be something that will blow you away. It will blow me away. Paul said when he saw it, he wanted to die. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He was caught up to the third heaven, the Bible says. Let's just contemplate that verse tonight. I, it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Do you love him tonight? That means that there's a wonder, many wonders waiting for you. So you have excited expectations. What does it mean for you tonight? Well, let God speak to you. Let him tell you what it means. What about tomorrow? What about the rest of your life? So tonight, I want us to just close in prayer. But I want you to really pray. You don't have to follow me in prayer. You can pray your own prayer. It doesn't have to be long. It can be very short. But it can be talking about God's, wor about worshiping God, praising Him, and about His wonders. So let's just pray tonight. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you, Lord God, for the fact that you give us so many wonders, Lord, supernatural wonders. You are the El Olam, beginning and the end. And Lord, I know you're the beginning and the end of my life. But my life will not end just on this planet. It will begin again when I step into heaven. Lord, I'm thankful tonight that you give us promises. Lord, I praise you. I praise you, Lord, because everything you've created has a way of praising. Maybe it's those circular motions that are, that are constantly in motion from the smallest of quirks, Lord God, to the largest of, of diameters of universes, Lord. Maybe everything's moving, praising you, Lord God. And I'm thankful tonight that I can lift my voice and praise you. I pray a blessing on those that are listening tonight, Lord God. Let them realize that, they, yes, they're in middle space, but it's the middle space where Christ died for us. It's the one where he will be able to give us the wonders that only he can give us, that our eye hasn't seen, our ear hasn't heard, and what's waiting for us, Lord, because we love you. And we thank you right now, Lord God. We praise your name. Bless us now, Lord. I know you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us.